chapter 27, the 60s. The relative placidity and prosperity of American life in the 50s was disrupted forever by the 1960s. After Eisenhower left office in 1960, his vice president Richard Nixon rose on behalf of the Republican Party, while Democrats rallied behind Massachusetts Senator John F. Kennedy, JFK. Kennedy's public personality and good looks allowed him to overcome his relative youth and his Catholicism to eke out a victory in that election. For the previous presidents, Kennedy leveraged his personality as a political tool as he pushed his new frontier series of domestic reforms, uh, including popular tariff and tax cuts. His untimely no uh, November 1963 assassination during a uh, parade in Dallas, Texas, lifted Kennedy as a symbol of the nation's thwarted aspirations. And President uh, Lyndon Johnson's Warren Commission and their report that they published failed to convince many Americans that Kennedy's assassination wasn't a part of a larger conspiracy to prevent even more optimistic changes across American society. If we think of 9-11 as sort of a seminal event uh, for a lot of people alive today, Kennedy's assassination is the event that a lot of people um, 60 years and older think back and say, where, you know, that was the, that was the turning point in my life that, that changed everything. Lyndon Johnson used the tidal wave of emotion after Kennedy's assassination to enact an impressive and ambitious series of great society programs, especially when his Republican opponent uh, became Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater. Barry Goldwater. In 1964, in that election after Kennedy, uh, Kennedy's assassination and Lyndon ran for the presidency, Goldwater won just six states. But Goldwater's legacy propels conservative ideology even today. The legacy of Johnson's Great Society reforms include government housing assistance for the poor, federal aid to education, Medicare and Medicaid, and a federal budget that doubled between 1961 and 1975. Americans, however, would soon begin to understand that the expansion of federal programs, no matter how well-intentioned, could not alone solve America's social problems. The most difficult fight of the 1960s was that of racial justice. President Kennedy was sympathetic to the cause, but feared the political fallout of Southern Democrats should he embrace civil rights directly. But the pressure for change was uncontainable. Blacks in the North were leading the charge against discrimination in jobs, housing, and education in the 50s, and demonstrations against segregation only spread South by 1960. At segregated restaurants and bus stations across the country, the nation uh, encountered increasingly interracial groups of Americans beginning to flaunt the rules in protest of their unequal treatment often in the face of violent opposition, including nightsticks, tear gas, police dogs, and fire hoses, again coming through on America's television screens. Violent events in Alabama and Mississippi, including assassinations of black leaders and bombings of black churches that killed small children, finally propelled Kennedy to begin to push for anti-discrimination laws on a national stage after 1960, specifically the issues of segregation and unequal employment. His public assassination made Kennedy something of a martyr to the cause of civil rights just at the moment, or just as the moment reached its fever pitch. Despite filibuster attempts by Southern Democratic senators, civil rights bills began to move through Congress after Kennedy's death. Powered by the Freedom Summer, Freedom Summer of civil rights protests in 1964, where all sorts of Northerners came down to join uh, Southern efforts, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 became laws under his Vice President Lyndon Baines Johnson. Such efforts were widely opposed in the South by many whites who continued to find their voice in segregationist political leaders like Alabama Governor George Wallace. He will come back up again soon, George Wallace. As the movement rolled up victories across the American South, the movement's attention moved to northern cities beginning in 1965. Although Jim Crow laws had never formally existed in the non-slave states, de facto segregation existed in cities like Chicago, LA, Milwaukee, Cleveland, Detroit, St. Louis. After a series of riots uh, broke out in African-American neighborhoods, the civil rights movement fractured into two segments, those that emphasized cooperation with sympathetic whites and more radical groups. More moderate groups in an effort to end housing and employment discrimi discrimination across the country pushed affirmative action policies, affirmative action, arguing that data would need to be used to ensure equal access to jobs and housing. Against the increasingly slow pace and moderation of the civil rights movement, other black leaders began to argue against assimilation with the white world and to push for a new racial and cultural distinctiveness apart from whites. This new ideology came from revolutionary organizations like the Black Panthers. It was rooted in the faith of Islam and it stood opposed to the exclusionary qualities of white America. I'm gonna put the Black Panthers on here. Progress would come from separation, not assimilation. 
Malcolm X, for many, is as important uh, a civil rights leader as Martin Luther King Jr. because he instilled in persecuted blacks a sense of pride and distinction they'd been denied as America, uh, as white America had flourished. In international affairs, such as in domestic reform, the optimistic liberalism of the Kennedy and Johnson administrations dictated a more aggressive policy to dealing with the nation's problems. Kennedy in particular was unsatisfied with the nation's ability to meet communist threats in the third world, the areas in which Kennedy believed the real struggle against communism was being waged, third world countries, so-called. He greenlighted the expansion of special forces, soldiers trained specifically to fight guerrilla conflicts. He supported softer approaches too, including the Peace Corps, which sent young American volunteers abroad to work in developing areas in those third world countries. In Cuba, the Bay of Pigs invasion to overthrow communist uh, Prime Minister Fidel Castro was fumbled between Eisenhower and Kennedy and it fell to pieces in just two days. This botched operation chilled negotiations with the Soviet Premier Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev, who was also unhappy with a mass exodus of residents of East Berliners to the western portion of the city. In late 1961, Khrushchev had built a wall between East Berlin and West Berlin. Hastily, overnight, they threw up this, this concrete barrier. For 30 years, this Berlin Wall served as the most potent physical symbol of the conflict between the communist world and the democratic world. Roughly a year later, a wave of Soviet scientists and technicians began to arrive in Cuba, and aerial photos produced evidence that Soviets were constructing uh, sites on the island for nuclear weaponry. To the Soviets, this likely seemed a good defensive move. The Americans, though, the missile sites represented an act of aggression less than 100 miles off the American border. The tense exchanges between Kennedy and Khrushchev over the course of 13 nerve-wracking days constitute the Cuban Missile Crisis, which followed the Bay of Pigs an invasion attempt, a time when we were on the brink of nuclear war with the Soviet Union. Kennedy and his Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, though tactfully handled the affair and kept us out of nuclear war. Despite efforts to de-escalate conflicts with communist nations, the controversial Gulf of Tonkin incident, where American sailors on the USS Maddox falsified a report about a dramatic battle with North Vietnamese torpedo boats, served as a pretext for escalating America's involvement in the Vietnam conflict. The agonizing war in Vietnam. At first a minor third world struggle on the periphery of the Cold War bounced between Kennedy, Johnson, or Lyndon Johnson, and later, President Nixon. By the end of 1967, more than half a million American troops, most of them drafted, not volunteers, had participated in the brutal fighting. For years, policies of attrition and pacification failed to end conflict, in which swirled communist, Catholic, Buddhist, American, French, Soviet, Chinese, and nationalist Viet Cong forces, all vying for control. Efforts to win the hearts and minds, famous expression, of these people in, in uh, North Vietnam gave way to heavy handed tactics like forced relocation of rural people, susceptible, deemed susceptible to communist sympathies. The conflict disillusioned millions of Americans and politicians who watched death tolls and wartime atrocities pile up year after year after year on their television screens. No one knew what was going on in Vietnam. The Vietnam War divided the Democratic Party into two warring camps. Those against continuing the American involvement in the conflict tended to side with John F. Kennedy's younger brother. Robert Kennedy or Bobby Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy, who rose in the 1968 primaries as the anti-war presidential candidate. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Kennedy were subsequently assassinated within months of each other, tragically later that year, 1968. That year, the 1968 Democratic National Convention in, in, Convention in Chicago, the DNC 1968, then as a result was a mess of protests and debate over the party's future. Two Kennedy brothers had been assassinated within five years of each other. The figurehead of the civil rights movement was now dead. And conflict over the Vietnam War was acrimonious along the two wings of the party. Richard Nixon and all this chaos quietly reemerged after his 1960 loss to Kennedy to begin to represent the conservative Republican silent majority, is what he called it, in American life. He won that 1968 election with only 43.4% of the popular vote. The liberal Minnesotan uh, Democratic um, candidate Hubert Humphrey did respectively, and that's who the Democrats settled on. But George Wallace, uh, the segregationist Alabama governor, had siphoned off 13% of the vote. Despite all of the progress of the civil rights movements and the energy of the anti-war movement, the election of Richard Nixon made it clear 
that at least a plurality of the American electorate was more interested in restoring stability than in promoting social change in America. After Nixon's 1968 election, a new youth culture emerged from the University of Sunny California and spread across the country. This new left counterculture movement was sparked by protests, self-expression, and oppositions to Nixon's war draft. They supported sex, drugs, and the music of Bob Dylan, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, Jefferson Airplane, the Grateful Dead, among many others. Out in the East Coast, both the Woodstock Music Festival and the Stonewall Inn riots, Stonewall Inn, Woodstock, by gay Americans at the Stonewall riots in 1969 served as important moments in the history of this new left movement. The new left challenged modern American society, attacking what it claimed were its banality, its hollowness, its artificiality, and its isolation from nature. Native Americans, Latinos, feminists, homosexuals staged protests across 1968 and 1969 in a bid to claim a civil rights movement of their own, and they made significant steps toward equality in this era. Feminism, closely associated with that new left ideology, experienced a national rebirth at this moment. The many women were living out in the post-war American dream that American society created for them. Many of them were in fact deeply frustrated, living lives of isolation with no outlets for their intelligence and their talents in American suburbs. By the time of Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique came out, a very famous book, President Kennedy had already helped pass the Equal Pay Act, which barred the pervasive practice of paying women less than men for the same work. Increasingly, the social problem of sexism was being linked with racism. Women made rapid progress as they moved into economic and the political mainstream. The nation's all-male institutions gradually opened their doors to women beginning in this era, and Congress required equal opportunities for women in college athletics by passing Title IX legislation. As the 1960s drew to a close, America teetered between its desire for social progress and its preference for social unity. 